final speaker is Mark Kelman, who is, oh, oh, he's from the Sunshine Coast, Queensland, represent. All right, so I've got a few disclosures to make. I'm very fortunate at the moment to be able to be able to benefit from both a postgraduate scholarship from the University of Sydney and also the RSPCA's Alan White Scholarship from 2017. So with both of these, this has been able to help the research which I'm doing, which I'm going to talk about today. I'm also a co-founder and a director of the charity Pause for a Purpose, which I'm also going to talk about today. And if anyone's interested in the work that we're doing, please either come to us on the stand and see us at the conference, or else go to the website and you, you can contact us that way as well. So today's talk is going to be about a disease that hurts puppies. But let's start with puppies. Puppies are cute and cuddly and lovable. And I think anyone who sees a puppy will find it very hard not to take that puppy home. But puppies, while they're small, and until they grow to be a full adult dog, are also very vulnerable. They're vulnerable to disease. And the worst disease that a puppy can catch is a disease called canine parvovirus. Now, I don't like talking about what parvo does to puppies. But briefly, parvo attacks a puppy from the inside. It causes terrible vomiting and diarrhea. They bleed internally. It causes immune suppression and dehydration. And puppies can die within 24 hours. They go from being a happy, healthy, squeaky puppy to sometimes dying in their owner's arms with an instant, and it's a terrible, terrible disease. And the worst thing about this virus is that it can live in the environment for 12 months, sometimes even longer. And as a result, a person can walk through the park in a contaminated environment. They can take the virus. They can take the virus into their home. And as a result, if their puppy is not fully immunized, or if the puppy has had its vaccines but it's not seroconverted properly, or if it hasn't been exposed to the virus and got immunity, then as a result, this puppy can die from this disease without even leaving the house. It truly is a tragic situation. Now, the good news is that this virus, thankfully, is not everywhere. And in most cases in Australia, we actually don't see the virus too badly. So in the capital cities and in the more affluent areas, parvo is not such a big problem. However, in some areas, it's still terrible. In some areas, it's still really bad. Now, to tell you a bit about where parvo came from, parvo has only been around for actually a fairly short period of time as viruses go. So, in fact, yes, the 1980s, the days of the Rubik's Cube of big hair, which I clearly missed out on. <laughs> <laughs> and disco, this is when parvo originated. So it's really only been around for nearly 40 years, like me, it's only nearly 40 years young. But apparently, when parvo first came into existence, and I, like I said, I was only just coming into existence at the same time, it was reported that back in 1980, when parvo first came to Australia, so it emerged in the late 1970s and it came to Australia in 1980. This was the first major outbreak. And it was reported that 66,000 cases of parvo may well have occurred in that time. I see nodding heads. Some people were here. They remember these times. And 10,000 deaths may well have occurred during those years. So you may well ask, that being the case, how many cases do we see now? How many deaths do we see now? And the answer is, we don't really know how big a problem parvo is today. The reason being we don't have good surveillance data for cat and dog diseases, and so we really don't know where this virus exists, where the disease is occurring, or even how many cases are really occurring across Australia. So what do we know? What we do know is that in 2010, 1,451 cases were reported by a national disease surveillance system that was a voluntary system that was working back in 2010. Now, there is most likely significant underreporting, and in that particular case, we know that only around 7% of vet clinics were logging cases into that system, and they certainly weren't logging all the cases into the system at the time. We know that we don't really see parvo in the capital cities. So like I said, mostly in the more affluent areas, we don't see this disease. Sometimes in the outskirts around capital cities, we do see it in the lower socioeconomic areas. But in the rural areas, there is more than twice the risk of seeing parvo. It's truly terrible in some of these large regional centres. We know this from experience. What we also know is the parvo vaccines that we have today are highly effective. Most parvo vaccines are around 95 to 99% efficacious, so the vaccines themselves work really well. 
Now, I'm fortunate over my varied career to have seen Parvo, or unfortunate, you could say, to have seen Parvo in various different stages, which I can talk about. Before I even graduated as a vet, I worked as a student in general practice in Perth, and that was when I first came to meet Parvo when I was a veterinary student working in practice there. Then when I graduated, I worked at the RSPCA in New South Wales, and that's where I truly met this disease for the first time. It's a truly terrible thing to see when you're talking to a mum and her little kids, and you have to explain to them why you've got to take their puppies away, and it really is a thing that we shouldn't have to see for veterinarians today, to have to tell children why they have to part from these puppies they love so much, because the puppy's not going to make it through this disease. Then I was fortunate to work in veterinary industry and pharmaceuticals for a company that made really good vaccines. So I can testament to the fact that the vaccinations work really well. The problem is what we still don't know is whether or how much parvo is occurring in these different areas around Australia. We don't know why the high risk areas themselves are high risk, but we do think that vaccination is part of that, not vaccinating in the right places. What we also don't know is whether during parvo outbreaks, which are certainly occurring all across the country, whether we can stop these outbreaks using intervention strategies, because if we can find a solution like this, this could be something we could do to really make a difference. And I wanted to find out the answer. So I embarked on a PhD. I'm very fortunate to have contacts at the University of Sydney, some amazing professors who were willing to come on this journey with me. Um, they've come on, come on as co-authors and research supervisors for this project. So together we started a national survey approaching every single veterinary clinic across Australia. And for the survey to be successful, we decided we literally had to ring every clinic to try and see if they'd be involved. Now, I was able to bring together an extensive team of veterinary students and puppy-loving volunteers. And together, some of us, myself included, literally rang over 200 veterinary clinics each in order to get this message across to see who do our survey. And as a result, we got a 24% response rate, which for a survey of this size is really good. So the first question we asked vets was how much parvo they thought we actually saw around Australia. And interestingly, on average, the vets who don't see parvo in their clinics thought that maybe we saw 1,000 cases. Those who did see parvo thought it was a few thousand more. And 80% of veterinarians believe that we probably see 5,000 or less cases of parvo. That would be bad enough. But what happened was we also asked them individually how many cases they saw. And those answers really shocked me. Across Australia, the majority of, of clinics sort of don't see too many cases, but of the clinics that reported parvo, 148 clinics saw between one and 10 cases. That was 500 cases collectively. The next category, 11 to 20, another 500 cases. Some clinics saw between 20 and 50 cases, another one and a half thousand cases of parvo there. Some clinics saw between 50 and 100 cases, and others still between 100 and 300 cases. That's practically a puppy every day that's catching parvo. You know, and these vets have to deal with this day in, day out. It's terrible. Altogether, the 24% of clinics around Australia saw between four and four and a half thousand cases of parvo in the years that they reported to us. This is a true tragedy that we're seeing across Australia. If we extrapolate the data out, and our data was broadly representative, that's 20,000 cases that are occurring across the country. On average, 40% of parvo cases are euthanized. The majority of those before they're even treated because of the severity of disease or the fact that the clients cannot afford to treat the cases. And based on data that we already have, we know that, say, 18% of cases will actually end in death regardless of euthanasia. That's more than 50% of the puppies that are catching this disease that are dying. That's 10,000 puppies dying every year from this disease. So what can we do? I think that we can vaccinate the puppies that are not being vaccinated, and if we can do that in these areas, because the truth is we're not reaching puppies in these places where there are epidemics occurring. If we could actually vaccinate these dogs, we can stop them catching the disease, we can stop them dying from the disease, we can stop them spreading it, and potentially we could stop it altogether. So the good news is that as well as all the data we collected around how much parvo is occurring, we also asked veterinarians their opinions and their experience and their knowledge around how those who are seeing cases are dealing with these outbreaks. So we've got extensive data there on how we can be making a difference. We're now starting vaccination campaigns and communication strategies in some of these areas to see if that can make a difference as to how we can stop parvo occurring. 
We're looking at herd immunity data in these areas, so we can see from the veterinary clinics how many cases of parvo are coming in, and after these strategies, we can show whether these, you know, these strategies are actually working. And if we can produce a model that works, then we can roll it out to potentially every community across Australia and maybe get rid of this disease altogether. We've also started a disease surveillance system to replace the system that closed in 2017. And the great news is that in the 10 years that have happened between the last system being created and the new system being made, there's been tremendous technological improvements. And because of those changes, we're now able to create a system that not only is able to map and see cases that are being logged in, but produce alerts and notify people as to when disease cases are actually starting. We can stop epidemics before they occur. But to do this, we've got to stop these epidemics that we're already seeing. This is a picture of a puppy that I showed you at the beginning of the slides. This is Eddie. He was a shelter pup who presented to a veterinary clinic in the central coast of New South Wales. They fell in love with this puppy, and sadly, he wasn't able to be saved. Eddie is one of the 10,000 puppies that died in 2017, and this year there's going to be 10,000 more unless we do something about it. But I think that as a community, we can work together. We can get the whole veterinary profession together. We can get the dog breeders, the vet clinics, the animal shelters, you know, the public and the media. And if everyone gets behind this disease, we can stop parvo occurring. And I'm going to ask you, let's get together and let's make parvo history. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>